what is forgiveness? In our normal, general, everyday understanding of forgiveness, we think of it as the release of a grievance. It's when we let go of anger, bitterness, resentment that is the result of some sort of a offense or a transgression or the release of a debt. And so what this means is that there needs to, in the first place, be a grievance. Beforehand, there needs to be anger. There, there has to be the existence of bitterness and resentment. A debt has to have been incurred, and then it needs to be released. And then at that point of release is the forgiveness. So this can color our perception when we think of God giving forgiveness, that we think of it in these same terms. God has a grievance, and then we do whatever, and he agrees to let go of that grievance against us. And what I want to suggest is that God doesn't ever hold the grievance to begin with. So we have an imperfect understanding of forgiveness as it pertains to God because we have our perception of forgiveness as requiring firsthand being angry, firsthand being in a state of having a grudge against someone, having some kind of thing that you're holding against someone in bitterness and in resentment, and then saying, okay, I'm going to let go of that. And I want to suggest that when God gives forgiveness, it's something far greater than simply say, deciding not to be angry anymore or deciding that you don't owe your debt anymore and that there's something way bigger than that. And so if we look at the root of what the word forgive means, we will see that it shows us, it points us towards certain things that show us a better understanding of forgiveness than simply letting go of a grudge. And so first let's just start by taking a look here at what our understanding of forgiveness is in Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So, clearly this is our normal conception where we're holding something against someone and we decide, okay, I'll forgive you for that. I'll let that go. I'll, I'll brush that away and move on. So, Jesus says, you know, until 70 times 7, which has a significant meaning there because it, it deals with the 70 weeks um, as well. Uh, but what he's indicating is to, to just continually forgive. But nevertheless, this still gives us this idea where you're holding something against someone and then you let it go. And I want to look at how there's nothing being held against in the first place. So, as in a previous video, God declared everything to be very good when he made everything, and he's never spoken a word against that. He's never reversed that decision. So, there's never anything to be let go. But this is the kind of understanding we need to have because of how we perceive the world, and therefore we need an idea of a God who can let go of a grudge, but we can then move on to a greater understanding of what it really means. And so if we look at the word forgive, the first four letters, or first three letters, F-O-R, are a prefix that indicates to let go. Well, forgive means to let go in a, in a very simplistic term. And so the four means to completely do something so it's it's a it's a it's a completed act and it means to give something away and it indicates separating from something and so when we look at forgive we have 
a prefix before the word give. And so it's something that is given completely. It's something that is given away. And it is something that you, you are releasing from it. That's the separation is to release it. And it comes from a root from uh, that means to be in, in front of or before. So as we read in the Bible that everything was planned from before the foundation of the world. So we can also understand that not only is this a completion of giving something away, but that it is something that comes before the transgression. This is something that happened before everything. This is, this is the original act of completion. And so then the word give, we, we kind of have an idea of what that means when, when you hand something over. And give is rooted in holding, to some, holding something or having it in your hand. It's related to having a possession. And of course, the word gift is from the same root as the word give. So to forgive is to completely give away as a gift all that you have, hold, and possess, in this case, before the foundation of the world. And so the next thing we see is what, to me, is the very lens through which to, to view everything. Um, to be consistent with this, that Jesus only speaks on behalf of the Father, that Jesus says, He that seen the Father has seen me. He is the perfect representation of the nature and character of God. His life and ministry shows what kind of person God is. And ultimately, hanging there, being brutally and unjustly murdered, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So, this is not good cop saying to bad cop, please forgive them. Um, well, at least as long as they don't know what they're doing, uh, which would make ignorance uh, an excuse. It would <laughs> kind of contradicts typical evangelism to say, um, you know, that you have to have the right understanding of something in order to be saved, whatever that means. But here he's saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. If you wanted to interpret it that way, you could say that ignorance is salvation, which would make evangelism the worst thing that you could possibly do, because then once somebody knows better, You've just condemned them. Um, so there's that. But this is not what he's saying. He's not saying, as long as they're ignorant, then go ahead and forgive them, please. This is a divine proclamation by the king of all creation, saying, you're forgiven. And also adding, you don't even understand what you're doing. Um... They, they killed him for blasphemy because he made himself equal to God. And he said, God is your father, and God is my father, and he looks like me, and you look like him. This is blasphemy. This is what he was, he was killed for, and he said, you just don't understand. Um, this is God's position. Not, not, oh boy, now I can finally let go of this grudge I've been holding against you, but you don't even understand. So, we can prove that this is not just an unanswered plea. Because we go to Colossians 1.12, and we'll read up to verse 17. And it says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the powers of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So we see in this passage it starts out giving thanks to the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. And so here's this inheritance of the saints that, it, that we are now 
meets to be partakers, and meet means fitted, made to be. So if you have a certain size socket and a certain size bolt, the right size socket for that bolt is meat. It would be the one that fits. And so he, it says that he has made us. It's, this is a past act to be partakers of the inheritance. So this is consistent with the idea of giving us everything that he has. And so what is this inheritance? Um, and we'll look at that next. But here, again, in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, and the word even here is is telling us to equate the rest of this this phrase here, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins, the same thing. But here we see this mention of the inheritance in verse 12. And it it's expresses here that Jesus is the creator in whom are all things and everything consists of him. So then we go, and <laughs> this idea of, of the inheritance of which we are made meet to be partake, partakers is a study all of, of itself. It's a pretty extensive thing, so I'm just going to hit on a few things here. And we'll start here in Luke 10.22. Jesus says, All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man know who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And then we see there's a number of verses that express this, this same idea. We see Matthew 11:27, Luke 10:22, John 13:3, John 16:15, and this one here in John 3:35. The Father loveth the Son and hath given him all things into his hand. And then in Hebrews 1:1 1, 1 to 3, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That's just packed with all kinds of things to explore. But what it tells us is that in past, we were spoken to by the prophets, but now by his son. So the prophets are, are a past era. The son is now the means by which we discern who God is. And it further expresses to us that he is heir of all things. That's all things that, to which he is heir. And that he is the creator by whom he made the world, and that he is the express image of the, the person or the nature and character of God. So Jesus looks like God, God looks like Jesus. Therefore, we understand that anything that doesn't look like Jesus doesn't look like God. And anything that we attribute to God that doesn't look like Jesus is wrong. Okay, so that's that's one of the ideas to get out of this. If it doesn't look like the man Jesus, not some fantasy about what we imagine he's going to do when he comes back and incinerates the world, but the actual living man Jesus, in the years of his life and ministry, if it does not look like what we see expressed there, it's not God. And it says, furthermore, that by himself he purged our sins. This is not an act in which we participate. He did this. By himself, he purged our sins. And then he sat down because he was finished, not because he was tired. And the right hand of majesty on high indicates, right hand indicates inheritance, which supports the fact that he's heir of all things. He's in the right hand of the majesty on high, meaning in the position of power, authority, and inheritance. It doesn't mean to the right. He's not sitting to the right of God. He's sitting at the right hand, meaning he is the inheritance. So then, from there, we see that Jesus is heir of all things. But what does this have to do with our inheritance? And so, we'll go to Acts chapter 26, verse 18. And this is Paul in one of his recitings of how he came to his revelation. 
and before that, you know, Paul, you know, why are you persecuting me, etc. And so Jesus, this is in red, Jesus is saying to him, as he recounts this story, that he's being sent to the Gentiles. And we'll pick up there in verse 18, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, and me being Jesus. This is in red. Um, so here again, we have forgiveness of sins and inheritance put together in the same, I mean, wh one word right after the other with the word and in between. This is pretty clear that they're a tied concept that giving away everything, you know, Jesus gave everything. And so, it, <laughs> in preparation, I apparently forgot to, to do this, but um, when it comes to the parable of the, the merchant, he says the kingdom of God is like a merchant who sold everything to, to, to have this pearl of great price. And the understanding of this is that he, he gave everything in order to have this pearl because it was of such great value. And Jesus is the merchant. Okay, he's the one who gave away everything in order to have the pearl, which is you, me, everybody else. We're the pearls. You know, we're the pearl. He's the merchant. And so this is saying that he gave everything, and I unfortunately just realized I forgot to prepare that in my notes, but I did intend to carry that over, was this idea that what is given to us is all and that we're of such great value to God that he he gave all and so this significance here is that everything was given to the son and the son gave everything to us and so this is the this is the sequence of events of saying that everything before the foundation of the world was given so to forgive is not simply to let go of a grudge but to completely give away as a gift everything that he had before the foundation of the world to us for God so loved the world um, and so we'll look a little bit more here in Romans 8 verse 32 it says he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him with the son also freely give us all things so if he's willing to give of his own son, he's willing to give everything. That's the idea being expressed here, which is consistent with the, the merchant and the, the treasure and the pearl and everything that goes with this of, of God being a seeker seeking out his lost treasure. Um, so if he spared not his own son, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Well, there isn't something being withheld contrary to what is being told in the, the garden story of God's withholding something from you and it's on this tree and if you partake of that then you can finally be whole, complete, and happy. Um, God's not withholding something. He's giving us freely all things. So then we see in First Peter 1 in verses 3 to 5, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And this is important here. That it says, you know, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So it's God, that, it's the power of God that's keeping. And who, you know, who's the who? Well, the who is us. That he has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And here we see this inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. So this is not, you know, the, the kind of inheritance that we get here in, in normal 
uh, people world where, you know, you get my house and then the flood comes and now you've just got a house that's a disaster and it has mold growing in it and it's ruined and the insurance company won't pay for the damage and now you're just in a heap of trouble. Thanks a lot, Dad, for bestowing me this house that's now just a big mess in my life. This is not the kind of inheritance we're getting from God. We're getting something that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that never fades away. So, this is what we're getting, and it's not the way the world gives. It's the way God gives, which is freely all things. And so, we'll finish here in Romans 5, and I had a hard time even narrowing this down because there's so much good in Romans 5 that I love. But we're going to pick up in verse 12 and go to 18. And so, this is comparing and contrasting Adam to Jesus. And so it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And so, Adam is actually a figure of Christ, which is what it's saying here. He's the figure of him that is to come. And what he did is he, he saw that Eve, the wife, had done something and had gotten into a situation, and he said, I'm going with you. This is what Jesus did, is that he came into our world as one of us to endure everything that we we have to go through. He experienced it firsthand on his own as a man. And so this is what Adam did with Eve in the garden was, was if you're going to have this religion where you have this fear and this, this sense of, of lack, I'm going to go with you and experience that with you. Which is a different interpretation than religion normally teaches. Um, so Adam was actually a type of Christ in the story, which is what one thing that it's, it's saying. Um, and here it's saying that although sin is not imputed when there is no law, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses. Notice it says that death reigned from Adam to Moses. So this is being specific in saying that although the sin was not imputed because there is no law, because it's the law that actually imputes the sin, death still was was it reigned meaning there was the fear of death so upon eating of the tree they became aware to judge death as evil and something to be feared and therefore were afraid of God so even though there was no law saying you're not allowed to do this people still felt ashamed and afraid of God because of their ability to judge that death was evil and that gave them a fear of God to be afraid of God so even though there weren't there wasn't a law saying you can't do this and you can't do that because that's actually the cause of their being a sin imputed is to say don't do this and then someone does it and now it's wrong um, before that you have liberty but nevertheless even in liberty you have people being afraid of death so death reigned from Adam to Moses in spite of the fact that the law did not yet exist. And we get to verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, who hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the free gift. For the judgment was by one unto condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Um... Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And so, 
we see here that righteousness of one allowed the free gift to come upon all men unto justification of life. So, before the foundation of the world, God decided, before even creating anything, that he was going to completely give away as a gift all that he had held and possessed to us as an act of love. And that's what forgiveness really is.